Good morning. Today I'm going to speak on a different issue, which is the heart and kidney cross talks. And I'd like this presentation and other presentations making relationship of kidney to other organs because we should know the context of other diseases while we are treating our patients. First of all, I would like to thank the invitation of Professor Hamza Qabil, who invited me to share within the conference of cross talks that was held uh, by Egyptian Society of Cardiology uh, at uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce Damietta uh, last week. In this presentation, I'm going to repeat the, what I mentioned there with some added slides. I'm going to focus on introduction, followed by some points in cardiac syndrome, not going to cover it in details. And then acute kidney injury and the heart, hypertension and kidney, diabetes mellitus and cardiovascular diseases and the kidney, chronic kidney disease and the heart, uh, the cardiovascular complications within the domain of renal replacement therapies, the value of echocardiography within the nephrology uh, practice, and I'll end with a closing of the presentation. To start with, since all time, kidney was joined to the heart under the name cardiorenal section of internal medicine department. This was uh, at Harvard uh, in 1940 or 30, I'm not sure. The term cardiorenal disease as a cause of death was well, since a long time. As you see here, this is one of the, the first certificate of card of death stating that cardiorenal disease is the cause of death. And you can find books about cardiorenal ch uh, clinical challenges. Moreover, there is a regular journal known as Cardiorenal Medicine. And this is a regular journal with uh, satisfactory impact factor uh, so 2.2, so it is interesting issue. Many chapters in the most recent books speaking about interaction of the heart and the kidney. And I reviewed the literature between 2017 up to date, and I found more than 125 articles and some chapters and books. Let me to start with cardiorenal syndrome and some drugs. This is a very smart presentation of different types of cardiac syndrome. So we have heart and the kidney. So heart can affect the kidney, and the kidney can affect the heart, and you can find diseases or situations affecting both. This is the concept of relationship. So we have acute cardiac syndrome, and we have chronic cardiac syndrome, and we have acute renal cardiac syndrome, renal cardiac, and we have chronic renal cardiac syndrome, and then we have secondary chronic uh, cardiorenal cardio cardio syndrome. Just to clarify, acute cardiorenal syndrome, this is the cardiorenal syndrome type 1, and in this syndrome, there is abrupt worsening of cardiac function, leading to acute kidney injury. So acute coronary syndrome, acute decompensated heart failure, or cardiogenic shock causing acute heart failure, and then renal dysfunction. This is the typical cardiorenal syndrome type 1. Regarding chronic cardiorenal syndrome or cardiorenal syndrome type 2, here chronic abnormalities in cardiac function causing progressive chronic kidney disease. So chronic heart leading to chronic kidney, like congestive cardiac failure and the chronic heart failure leading to chronic kidney disease. Acute renal cardiac, so it is type 3, cardiac syndrome, sudden worsening of renal function, causing acute cardiac dysfunction, so acute kidney injury leading to acute cardiac dysfunction like uremic cardiomyopathy, secondary to acute renal failure, acute kidney ischemia, or glomerulonephritis that leads to acute cardiac injury or dysfunction. 
such as acute myocardial infarction, ischemia, congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema, and arrhythmia. In type 4 cardiorenal syndrome, it is chronic renal cardiac, conditions of primary CKD, so it is chronic kidney disease, leading to an impairment of the cardiac function and or increased risk of adverse cardiovascular events. Left ventricular hypertrophy and the stolic heart failure, secondary to renal failure, extreme burden of cardiovascular disease, risk in patients with CKD, such as coronary glomerular disease and its normal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Secondary uh, uh, cardiorenal syndrome or cardiorenal syndrome type 5, here there is a systemic disorder causing both cardiac and renal function, like septic shock, vasculitis, diabetes mellitus, systemic lupus erythematosus, infections, drugs, toxins, connective tissue disorders. So this is the definition and the types of cardiorenal syndrome. And this is an example of the type 5 cardiorenal syndrome, where sepsis affects badly heart and kidney. So you can find all these are different mechanisms within the context of sepsis, so cytokines, myocardial depression factors, impairment of microcirculation, uh, surface expression of adhesion molecules, myocardial ischemia, a prostanoid, endocellin, one upregulation, endothelial dysfunction, natri inducible nitric oxide, all these abnormalities is affecting, uh, are affecting the heart in the presence of sepsis. In the same moment here, acute kidney injury can accompany sepsis and always we are searching about infection in acute kidney injury and when acute kidney injury is accompanied by sepsis, mortality increased significantly. So you can here look, renal ischemia, cytokine activation leading to tubular damage and other factor as is factors that you can see in this slide. So this is a clear example of cardiorenal syndrome type 5. Uh, another strange type of cardiorenal syndrome is severe preeclampsia. So preeclampsia is considered a form of type 5 cardiorenal syndrome. It is an under-recognized entity in women's cardiovascular health. Here you can find in, within preeclampsia there is cardiorenal uh, affection. So heart is affected, altered the myocardial wall, damage the cardiomyocytes, leading to cardiomyocyte reduction, impaired contractility, myocardial stiffness, myocardial uh, remodeling, diastolic function heart disease. In the same moment, there is problem in kidney like endotheliosis, bodocyte loss and damage, leading to glomerular and tubular damage, and uh, chronic kidney disease at the end of the day. And here kidney can affect the heart and the heart can affect the kidney. So uh, both of them are affected by the systemic disease which are common in preeclampsia. So this is another strange. And lupus can affect both and a lot of examples. Let me go to another axis of interactions, heart, brain, and kidney interactions here. When there is afferent input to the brain, and then there is efferent sympathetic renal nerve activation with subsequent stimulation of beta-1 adrenergic receptor and beta-2 adrenergic receptor. All of us are aware with renin and angiotensin system and its, if, uh, its activation with subsequent increasing blood pressure and uh, cardiac hypertrophy and fibrosis, etc. Uh, but here, beta-2 adrenergic receptor stimulation of receptors within collecting duct leads to release of this uh, hormonal or humoral mediator that lead to stimulation of kidney macrophage to release uh, TNF. Uh, subsequently, endothelial cell releases GM granulocyte macrophage coolness colony stimulating factor that stimulates cardiac M2 macrophage with subsequent hypertrophy and fibrosis. So here there is interplay between brain receiving afferent, afferent impulse and then delivers efferent stimuli 
for many cascades. This is why we are interested even in management of severe hypertension. We can think of sympathetic denervation or baroreceptor uh, modulation. So a lot of issues and you may find in the, in the future drugs uh, targeting the best ways within this uh, axis. This is a schematic representation of the pathophysiology of cardiorenal syndrome, including uh, decompensated heart failure, leading to reduction of uh, cardiac function, increasing inflammatory mediators, oxidative stress. Uh, here, a lot of issues, congestion, renal dysfunction, a lot of issues you can find here. And this is a very important pathophysiological mechanism. Why? Because for each pathophysiological defect within this figure, there is a treatment uh, armamentarium that can help to improve patient situation. So for uh, decreasing cardiac output and increasing neurohormonal activity, we can find vasodilators, mechanical intervention, chronic ischemia interventions, the correct severe anemia, anotropes, intraortic balloon, etc., and assessing device, and as for the, and this will target redu reduced cardiac output. For neurohormonal and systemic vasoconstriction, you you may find vasodilators, ACE inhibitors, and receptor blocker and beta blocker. Uh, seralaxine is another vasodilator. It, uh, it is a recombinant protein, reacts on relaxine, leading to vasodilatation in the cell and receptor antagonist, uh, nebulescine inhibitors, and this is uh, approved in treating heart failure in combination with angiotensin receptor blocker, um, dopamine denervation, so all these uh, mineral, mineral code. Uh, corticoid receptor antagonist here for sodium retention, dietary restriction of salt using diuretics, and in case of failure of diuretics, we can uh, think of extracorporeal me methods for the condition like ultrafiltration or hemofiltration. Again, here, here diuretics and ultrafiltration for congestion, uh, diuretics and ultrafiltration. So the congestion is one of the most important. Uh, treatment modality for cardiorenal congestion. And here this slide shows the structure of the nephron from glomeruli, proximal uh, convoluted tubule, distal convoluted tubule, and distal nephron, and lobe of Henle. So if you look here for uh, barriers uh, here, abnormal glomerular hemodynamics, so the treatment and the potential solution is to discontinue in the state and steroidal anti drugs. Consider holding is and ARBs, a low cardiac output, hemodynamic support, chronic kidney disease, or functional renal hyperfusion hyper increase uh, low diuretic dose. So, this is the regarding and reduce the GFR and its impact on the management of cardiac syndrome. Another barrier, the uh, proximal tubule hyperfunction. So, neurohormonal activation, here you can use ACE inhibitors and ARBs, sodium AVD states, and increased expression of sodium glucose co-transporter in case of diabetes, increased uh, lobe diuretics to solve the problem, proximal tubule diuretics like acetazolamides. For both direct effect, multiple daily doses, continuous lobe diuretic infusion, excessive uh, daily sodium intake, sodium restriction. And if we think of distal tubule hypertrophy, rebound sodium retention, so sequential nephron blockade combination of direct therapy that work on different nephron segments. For distal nephron hyperfunction, excessive aldosterone mediated sodium retention, so we can think of aldosterone antagonist or uh, potassium sparing diuretics or even sodium channel blockers. Excessive vasopressin mediated water retention, we can think of vasopressin antagonist, free water restriction to solve the problem. For lobe of Henle hyperfunction, uh, like uh, breaking effect, higher uh, the use of higher uh, lobe of diuretic doses. So this is 
the problem in the kidney and special site in the nephron and how to solve the problem again and again we starts with diuretics if there is a problem and if there is no response and resistance after using the maximal load that we can use with combined diuretics we can think of extracorporeal like hemofiltration or ultrafiltration although ultrafiltration doesn't improve survival but it will help the patient to be decongested and improvement of, of symptoms so this this is the summary and uh, under the title of stepwise treatment approach for symptomatic heart failure and the cardiac syndrome step one the patient the compliance optimized adherence to medication regimen and assault restrictions it is both of them are of bar amount importance so the patient should be adherent to treatment to have the maximal effect for electromechanical evaluate and treat arrhythmias and this uh, this chronic uh, anatomic with imaging cardiac catheterization catheter echo as appropriate for ischemic angioplasty stent and i'm going to discuss this issue in uh, and uh, regarding coronary angiography to do or not to do and the uh, the best choice angioplasty or cabbage for a renal patient i'm going to in, uh, discuss it in, in within this presentation other remediable uh, disorders uh, like valve heart disease, pericardial effusion, constricted pericarditis, anemia control, uh, and here we follow the CKD guidelines. Pharmacologic treatment uh, with dose reduction for hyper hypotension, its inhibitors, ARBs, or neuroblastin inhibitors with ARB combination, beta blocker therapy, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, diuretics of volume overload, congestion symptoms are present other agents like after uh, load reducing medications hydrolazine and digoxin although I, I don't like digoxin in the presence of advanced CKD and uh, uh, I always advise not to be used in dialysis patients for worse in the renal function and effective diuresis and persistent heart failure begin step the approach to escalate pharmacologic treatment preferably algorithms based focus on dose adjustment to avoid hypotension and further renal impairment re-evaluate for concurrent renal disease renal cardiac syndrome consider the primary nephrologic disorders either parenchymal or obstruction consider evaluation for unilateral or bilateral renal artery stenosis if necessary barosynthesis or other specific therapies to reduce intra-abdominal hypertension and abdominal compartmental syndrome and to relieve renal ven venous hypertension and renal congestion. For step three, for persistent hypotension, renal dysfunction and acute decompensation heart failure, reassess to further optimize pharmacologic care with diuretic and inotropes, consider ultrafiltration but acknowledge risks of renal deterioration and the catheter related and or anticoagulation related complications begin cautious extracorporeal ultrafiltration especially patients condition is uh, refractory to pressors using intermittent slow ultrafiltration when hypotension uh, doesn't preclude adequate fluid removal over typically four to six hour sessions Continuous ultrafiltration when equipment is available and the patient becomes hypotensive or has worsening renal function with intermittent treatment sessions. So this is the roadmap of treatment of cardiorenal syndrome in a stepwise manner. So regarding some interesting and old issues within the literature, so this is a very interesting review about the use of immune checkpoint inhibitors this is one of the most important uh, FDA approved biologic treatment for uh, resilient cancers like uh, lung cancer, melanoma, and other malignancies. Here I'm going to just to show you that the new drugs may be associated with problems. So here cut renal complication. The uh, uh, one idea is tumor cells, tumor tissues 
can be presented by the dendritic cells, so the uh, and tumor will present ligands like PD ligand one. PD means programmed death ligand one that binds programmed death one on the surface of T lymphocyte. When programmed this ligand bind its receptor with the lymphocyte, lymphocyte will, from the name it will be way exhausted and it will be suppressed and this will lead to a flourishing of tumor. So this is why one of the treatment modality is to use antibodies dedicated for this uh, pathway to uh, block this uh, binding and then to resume the activity of T-cell to combat malignancy. So this is one of the pathways. A lot of drugs are now available and FDA approved for treating uh, cancer. Like, as I mentioned, Nivlumab, it is PD-1, another molecule. So you can look at the names and this is the uh, cancer type uh, that the drug uh, is used to treat. Here, so long as this class of drugs, checkpoint inhibitors, stimulates lymphocytes. So it stimulates immunity, stimulates inflammation, and some patients may present with complications of this inflammation and immunological stimulation like interstitial nephritis in kidney, like acute renal graft failure because of severe rejection after stimulating immunity. And here, the, the, this uh, drug and other drugs can be associated with kidney problems like tubular injury, crescentic glomerulonephritis, acute interstitial nephritis, uh, glomeruli with mesangial hypertrophy, and proliferation. And the heart is associated with troponin elevation, New arrhythmias, pericardial effusion, uh, pericardial with effusion, cardiac tamponade, uh, myocardial fibrosis, myocarditis, new conduction uh, block. So a lot of problems can be presented in the heart. So the use of new drugs may be complicated by cardiorenal complication. And one of the best uh, here data that uh, was presented one week ago in the Lancet, that there is increasing through the years, increasing the rate of myocarditis. This is non-fatal, and the darker color is fatal myocarditis. So we should be aware. Suppose that we treat cancer with this drug, and then we find the cardiorenal problems. How to treat? The treatment is to discontinue, and then if there is no response, we may, we may add immune suppression like steroid and other immune suppressive drugs. And if the effect is just mild rise of creatine, we can think of other toxic drugs to be discontinued first and to monitor the patient properly, and then we are destroyed. But I think if the complications is cardio, uh, uh, the complication is cardiorenal, in this scenario, the drug, it's better to be discontinued and the patient the situation treated properly. Regarding acute kidney injury, and its impact on the heart for many uh, decades. Acute kidney injury was thought to be isolated kidney disease, leading to consequences of disturbance of kidney function. However, nowadays we know properly that there is a crosstalk between kidney and all the body systems. So we have kidney brain crosstalk. You can find uremic encephalopathy, dementia, stroke. Kidney heart, acute kidney injury heart, congestive heart failure, arrhythmias, ischemic heart disease, acute lung injury, alter the hepatic, alter the gut, intestine, and alter the immunity. So a lot of crosstalks between kidney and other organs. This, uh, this idea stimulated us to do some research with medical students at Mansoura Faculty of Medicine, and this is one of the publications that we created here, not with the heart, but with the brain. So after doing ischemia, perfusion injury, rat model, we tested the increased uh, this pathway, upregulation of toll-like receptor within the brain. So after creating the, uh, doing the model, and the, after three days of ischemia, perfusion injury, brain was examined 
by immune histochemical and we found that tolactin receptor 4 is enhanced and this may open the horizon for treating tolactin receptor 4 to prevent encephalopathy coming to kidney injury. Another crosstalk that we um, examined with medical students is the relationship with pancreas. So acute kidney injury ischemia refusion injury of the kidney was associated in this experimental uh, study with pancreatic injury and insulitis. Another work was, was uh, the hepatic injury. So a lot of crosstalks, but I think that we didn't publish the heart, acute kidney injury heart relationship. Another issue between heart and kidney in acute kidney injury domain is cardiac surgery associated acute kidney injury. And this is a very nice review showing the different pathophysiologic mechanisms or the potential pathophysiology accompanying cardiac surgeries, maybe vasoconstriction, maybe uh, reduced renal perfusion, here impulse, uh, nephrotoxic agents, all these factors, hormonal mediators, inflammation, all these factors can lead to uh, acute kidney injury. And the most important issue, acute kidney injury or rise of creatinine is not just numerical value, but it carries poor consequences on the short term and on the long term. So you can find electrolyte disturbance, fluid overload, and on the long term, if the patient uh, uh, continued, you can find CKD and increasing mortality if the patient is not continuing. So how to do, how to solve the problem? The is prevention is better than cure. So we can think of aggressive uh, reduction of risk factors uh, using biomarkers uh, still for research purposes. Clinical risk factors are important to be known and to be treated aggressively. Uh, Pre-operative, intra-operative, and post-operative risk factors should be always searched and treated properly. Adherence to KD guidelines on prevention of acute kidney injury, discontinuation of all nephrotoxic agents, avoidance of hemodynamic instability, close monitoring of serum creatinine, and the avoidance of hyperglycemia. So vigilance and vigilant care makes a great difference. Let us to shift to one of important issues regarding the issue, uh, is it uh, angioplasty? or cabbage, the preferred line of revascularization for patients with chronic kidney disease. Why I am putting it in the acute kidney injury domain, you will, you will know now if you read the title, acute kidney injury following coronary revascularization. So just to um, give the clear message, in the past, cabbage was preferred, but currently, after the ev uh, evolving drug eluted stents, drug eluted stents if the anatomy is permissible. So we start with angioplasty for patients with chronic kidney disease and uh, leaving cabbage as a secondary treatment. Uh, but uh, because cabbage may be associated with mortality in the short term, and the, uh, you may find the stenosis after cabbage. So if the anatomy permits, start with angioplasty and then leave cabbage as a second line of treatment. And this article adds to the literature that it's not only mortality, but also acute kidney injury. Look here, acute kidney injury, cabbage is the black color bar, and the gray one is the uh, angioplasty uh, coronary intervention, primary coronary uh, percutaneous intervention. Acute kidney injury, here, uh, no acute kidney injury, is associated with angioplasty, acute kidney injury, stage 1, stage 2, and stage 3 are significantly higher with cabbage with surgery in comparison to angioplasty. To cut it short, if there is acute coronary syndrome in a patient with chronic kidney disease, the priority is to uh, PTCE uh, and then leaving cabbage as uh, the, the last resort. Based on higher mortality and this data that shows cabbage is associated with higher risk of acute kidney injury on top of chronic kidney disease. Regarding contrast associated, is it con contrast associated or contrast induced acute kidney injury? I think it's very hot topic between cardiology and nephrology. And I am myself 
uh, I was hesitating in the past because I am conserving uh, the kidney because I am a nephrologist. But currently, I advise if the risk stratification necessitates cardiac catheter and revascularization, please don't hesitate to do revascularization, irrespective to kidney function. And the, this this is uh, some debate about the bro or uh, cone regarding contrast induced or contrast associated. Let us agree that contrast is toxic. Uh, but if we release coronary ischemia, the effect of release of coronary ischemia on the kidney may be beneficial, may be positive outweigh the risk of using contrast. But my advice to the cardiologist, please, number one, you should assess the patient if his situation will be benefit from doing revascularization or not. What is the risk certification? Number two, use least possible dose of non-ionic Iodinated contrast media, either low or isoosmolar, doesn't differ, but the most important is use the least possible dose. And please don't exceed the maximum radiographic contrast dose, which it can be calculated easily by multiplying 5 by body weight and divided by serum creatinine. So if you have a patient 60 kilogram, so 5 uh, multiplied by 60, it is 300. If creatinine is 1, it is 300. If creatinine is 2, the maximum radiographic contrast dose is 150 ml of available uh, contrast. If the creatinine is high, before the contrast, give a good hydration. If the situation of the heart cannot allow us to give fluids, at least we stop nephrotoxic drug, and we may depend upon drugs like statins to be given in large dose per procedural before the current intervention. What is the standard of care protocol is to use saline, one mill per kg per hour for 12 hours before, and the same after doing coronary angio, if it is elective. But if it's urgent, I think, as we recommended from Egyptian study of nephrology, it is better to use uh, bicarb, isotonic bicarb. It should be isotonic. How to prepare Isotonic bicarb is uh, to mix 154 ml from the hypertonic bicarb uh, up to one liter of uh, by uh, glucose 5% or distilled water because the available uh, bicarb is hypertonic 1000 milliequivalent per liter, not 154 like isotonic saline. This is why we dilute it with distilled water or glucose 5% to reach uh, the isotonic level. So the, why isotonic bicarb in the presence of urgent coronary angio? Because the protocol of bicarb is to give the patient 3 milliliter per kg over one hour infusion, and then followed by uh, 1 milli per kg per hour for six hours. So we can give the infusion over one hour before, three milliliter per kg of isotonic bicarb, and then we continue after the procedure, either by bicarb or isotonic saline, it doesn't matter. Regarding hypertension and the kidney cross talks, I'm not going to discuss hypertension because it's very, it is, it is a branch of medicine. So, uh, but here I want to, to just to highlight some important change in the mind of the investigators about salt induced hypertension because from its name it may be the, that salt is retained because the kidney is inefficient in getting rid of sol sodium. But here when they compared salt sensitive and salt resistant they found that the kidney is capable of get rid, getting rid of, uh, of salt. So the problem is not in the salt but in the vascular uh, here, the renal vascular resistance in salt sensitive patients is increased significantly with association of increasing blood pressure. So this will open the horizon for a uh, change in the mind for treating uh, salt-induced hypertension so we can balance between diuretics and the vasodilators. And this is the most recent that was published yesterday about urine sodium excretion 
blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and mortality, a community level prospective epidemiological cohort study. And the anal this analysis was done in 18 countries, including 95,767 part participants. The key message is excessive salt is bad, especially if it's above uh, sodium above 5 grams per day and to be uh, uh, restricted. And uh, the uh, potassium in fruits and the vegetable is beneficial as it is considered the antidote of salt. So we encourage our patients to restrict salt and to uh, enhance potassium intake so long as kidney function allow this. Another uh, study showing the uh, which drug to be added added uh, on antihypertensive drugs, the difference between different uh, drugs. So this is the number of patients here. The comparison beta blocker to cyazide, calcium chain blocker to cyazides, lob diuretics to cyazides, and cyazide diuretics. So this is a comparative uh, between uh, both of them. And in this study, calcium chain blocker blockers were shown to be beneficial regarding many issues. As you look here, the regarding the significant kidney events, here the uh, hazards uh, of the, uh, the kidney is significantly reduced by the use of calcium chain blocker. And the mortality is significantly less than beta blocker and the use of lobe diuretics. Although, if you read the article, you can find some limitations, but this data in favor of using calcium chain blockers uh, for the kidney and others. Is there a difference between angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blocker? This is the comparative efficacy of individual renin angiotensin system inhibitors on major renal outcomes in diabetic kidney disease. And this is a network meta analysis and not direct meta analysis yeah, as. Uh, Concluded from the data, there is no significant difference between angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. A very interesting issue. Is there a link between increased dietary phosphorus, phosphate intake, and the blood pressure? And the more interesting here is this is healthy young adults. So the study included. 20 young adults with normal renal function. You can see the sample size is small. Yes, it is small, but the methodology is very fantastic. Here, the, uh, they started with baseline on regular diet, both groups, and then uh, these normal individuals were run randomly allocated into two arms. Arm with excessive phos phosphorus, uh, supplemented by so neutral phosphate, and the other arm is uh, treated with phosphate binder lanthanum. And after uh, weeks, vitamin D3 is given for both groups. And as you see, the visits as indicated by the arrows. Uh, and in uh, this study, they evaluate everything. The, the patients, uh, the, these uh, individuals were subjected to ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, uh, hormonal measurement, and Moreover, sympathetic uh, uh, evaluation by measuring urinary uh, catecholamines. And the key message is that there is a link between increasing phosph phosphate in the diet and increasing blood pressure. As you see here, in the period of high phosphate uh, diet, the uh, here regular diet and the regular diet, blood pressure is increasing and blood pressure. Blood pressure. If, this, if this will be our advice in future to uh, get, uh, to guard against cardiovascular disease and hypertension by uh, uh, avoiding excessive phosphate in the diet. I think we need here more and more studies, but it is very interesting that renal diabetes, kidney, and heart. Here, the link is very uh, clear that uh, both diabetes and the chronic kidney disease are associated with in cardiovascular problems, myocardial infarction, heart failure, and both heart failure can lead to kidney disease and kidney disease leads to heart failure. So diabetes, coronary kidney disease, and heart, this triad is a deadly alliance. 
And here I want to stress upon the novel non-traditional risk factors within the domain of diabetes and obesity. Hyperinsulinemia and increased sodium glucose per transporter to expression and increasing uh, glomerular hyperfiltration and reduction of tubular glomerular feedback. So in type 2 diabetes, there is a pathophysiological defect in the kidney, increased expression of sodium glucose co-transporter 2. Increasing sodium glucose co-transporter increases glucose and salt reabsorption by proximal contribute with subsequent hyperglycemia and reduction of sodium rich in macular densa and disturbance of tubular glomerular feedback. And this is what I mentioned. Diabetes and diabetic kidney disease are associated with cardiovascular disease deadly alliance. And so long as we are speaking about the kidney and the heart, and heart failure and diabetic patients, the use of sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitor, this is a class of drugs that work on sodium glucose co-transporter that uh, target proximal vestibule, leading to many mechanisms here, glycosuria, mild ketosis, and mild ketosis will improve cardiac uh, metabolism and reduce risk of worsening heart failure. Uh, here, enhanced tubular flow and diminished proximal sodium delivery, reduce the total body sodium content, and reduce uh, the worsening of heart failure, increase natriuresis, reduce the heart failure, improve the renal EPO production, leading to hemoconcentration, with improvement of anemia, and it may be associated with an improved O2 transport, oxygen transport, enhanced macular densa, chloride presentation, improvement of uh, tubular glomerular feedback, and uh, reducing the risk of uh, kidney and heart damage. So it's uh, the most interesting for my mind is sodium hydrogen exchange. So this is another pathway. The, the pathway is present on both, so sodium hydrogen exchange present, is present on the, in the kidney and in the heart. Blockade of sodium hydrogen exchanger by sodium glucose transporter to inhibitor, it affects kidney, protects kidney, and protects heart. So this is another mechanism beyond the issue of uh, it is uh, a diuretic. This is why in the nephrology literature, Nowadays, we are focusing on cardiovascular disease when we are treating diabetic kidney disease. In ongoing trials in heart failure, in diabetic patients with heart failure, a lot of studies, and more interestingly, the green labeled studies are patients without diabetes. So, so sodium glucose transporter inhibitor can be used without diabetes. Regarding the comparisons of other undiabetic drugs, and this uh, very recent huge data about superiority of sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitors in the presence of heart failure to all other treatment, followed by GLAB-1 receptor agonist. So it, uh, the use of sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitor, followed by GLAB-1 receptor antagonist, uh, agonist, is associ are associated with a reduction of all-cause mortality, heart failure, myocardial infarction, and uh, admission for heart failure. So again, this is a privilege. If we have a patient with dominant heart failure, the best is to use uh, sodium glucose transporter to inhibitors. If it, uh, there is no heart failure, we can use GLAB-1 receptor agonist. And the treatment of diabetic kidney disease is a holistic approach. We don't think we don't just restrict our armamentarium toward the kidney and the diabetes, but we should think of cardiovascular disease. So if you look here, the solid line refers to solid evidence. So sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibition is associated with uh, superiority in the outcome regarding cardiovascular disease and diabetic kidney disease. The same GLAB-1 receptor agonist for DV4 inhibitors, you'll find interrupted lines means that the evidence is not conclusive. So it is not only on diabetic drugs, but the use of uh, antihypertensive like uh, ACE inhibitors are solid line uh, with beneficial effect on both cardiovascular and diabetes is lipid control ETC. So it is holistic approach and not restricted. Please go to this uh, video because in this video I explained everything about anti-diabetic drug. But regarding sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitor, I want to add a statement. Up to this, up to date, 
We cannot give these drugs to patients with impaired, significantly impaired kidney function. So dabagliflozin needs SMG for above 60, and the rest of uh, uh, members within this class needs at least 45 uh, milli per minute SMG for. So the better, the earlier use, the better the outcome. Regarding chronic kidney disease and the crosstalk with the heart, uh, we are now aware by cardiorenal anemia syndrome. If you look here, if there is heart failure alone, 30 days and 90 days mortality are between these values. This is the uh, mortality rates. And if heart failure and anemia mortality increased, and if heart failure plus uh, coronary kidney disease mortality increased, either 30-day or 90-day mortality, and uh, if we have uh, this triad, deadly alliance, heart failure, coronary kidney disease or injury, and anemia, 30-day mortality is 40%, 90-day is 60%, and 186 amount of mortality is 73%. So should uh, 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 do something to protect the patients. CKD and the CRP, uh, and, the, and here the most important is MERS. What's MERS? We, we know MACE, Major Adverse Cardiovascular Event. And here, MERS, we add R renal to the MACE. And you may find MER just a disturbance of kidney function. So MERS are associated with inflammation. So if there is CKD plus high C-reactive protein, the MERS increases significantly, as you see, for false increase in heart risk in comparison to no CKD and no increased C-reactive protein. In chronic kidney disease, there is CKD, MBD. It is not only mineral bone disorder means bones or dystrophy. It is associated, this syndrome is associated with ex many hormones. Some of these hormones is FHF23 that affects the heart by hypertrophy and a lot of hormones. I'm not going to bother you by data. FHF23, if it is increasing, this is a very bad because look here, how the ratio of death increases significantly in patients with the trend of increasing FHF3. So if, if FHF3 is stable, hazard risk ratio of this is 1, and if it is rapidly rising, uh, so we monitor the serial values of FHF3 with the time. If it is increasing, mortality increases. And here, uh, the, uh, the effect is very, very high, highly significant in comparison to other it changes in estimated GFR, systolic blood pressure, or serum phosphate. So uh, here, this is FHF3. Uh, it's increasing and trajectory is associated with mortality. Vascular calcification is bad, and it is the end of the spectrum. So if we wanted to change, we should prevent vascular calcification. In CKD, in chronic kidney disease, there are promoters and uh, suppressors or inhibitors of vascular calcification. So it's better to know where to go to prevent vascular calcification, and it is very bad complications of CKD that can be diagnosed by uh, the plain X-ray, CT, or echocardiogram because vascular calcification may be uh, vessel calcification, heart calcification, valve calcification, or even catastrophic uh, uremic arteriolopathy or uremic uh, calciflexis. One of the important messages that I want to, uh, to say for uh, my colleagues and my professors in cardiology, HDL, which is a well-known protective type of live proteins in general population, is not HDL in coronary kidney disease and dialysis. So it is altered. And it, uh, the beneficial effects of high dense live protein is lost with coronary kidney disease. Another issue in the treatment of uh, atherosclerotic heart disease by using high intensity statin in CKD. CKD is not the general population. So please don't apply the advice of general population to chronic kidney disease. And this study uh, discussed this issue, association between intensity of statin and mortality 
in persons with chronic kidney disease. I know that the age is uh, here is the, all the patients are the majority are all the patients above 70 year, but the message is clear from this study regarding the uh, intensity of statin. Uh, what's meant by high intensity of statin is reducing LDL by more 50% by using, for example, atorvastatin 80 milligram uh, or big dose of rosuvastatin. Uh, this is the high intensity, and there is a moderate intensity statin, and there is low intensity statin. In this study, there was no difference in mortality between uh, regarding the use of high intensity statin. This is why I'm not supporting high intensity statin in the presence of chronic kidney disease patients and to uh, respect the guidelines within the CKD. Uh, so if, if the SMGFR is low, uh, the, uh, below uh, 45, uh, atorvastatin dose, uh, it's better to be restricted to 20 or less than 20 uh, milligram per day. Regarding the atrial fibrillation, there is excessive atrial fibrillation uh, risk in patients with chronic kidney disease. And when atrial fibrillation is added, mortality increased. So we should be cautious about all these issues and atherosclerosis and arrhythmias to be added as a factor in trials. What about renal replacement therapy domain? Is there a link with cardiovascular disease? Look at the United States renal data system. You will find all the names of cardiovascular disease and complications are there. Any cardiovascular disease, here this is the hemodialysis, hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and transplantation. So these are the three uh, different renal replacement therapy modality. So 70% or at least of hemodialysis patients have uh, cardiovascular disease. And this is more than 50%, 58% of peritoneal dialysis patients. 40 or 50% of transplant have problems in the cardiovascular system. And this is coronary, uh, uh, myocardial infarction, heart failure, valvular heart disease, uh, arrhythmias, ATC. And so on, this is the category according to different age. You can, uh, can find Irrespective to the age, there is increased risk of cardiovascular disease in hemodialysis patients and in peritoneal dialysis patients. And heart failure by its different types, systolic or diastolic, are uh, encountered in patients with dialysis. Uh, this may be due to many factors, including fistula, maybe, especially high output fistula. This is why we should think of fistula. So, a recommendation to reduce cardiac risk associated with arterial venous fistula, especially after uh, successful transplantation. So, considering creation of lower forearm fistula, especially in candidates at high risk of cardiovascular disease, to avoid high, very high uh, volume uh, and hyperdynamic circulation with the proximal fistula. Monitor blood flow in AV fistula by surveillance and consider reducing the flow in very high flow fistula. And when I asked the professors of vascular surgery at Mansoura University, they uh, recommended this approach. Consider routine ligation of arteriovenous fistula in stable kidney transplant patients, particularly high flow upper arm fistula. A backup arteriovenous fistula in pretend dialysis patients should be limited. I don't like this approach to uh, start a peritoneal dialysis and to have AV fistula at the same moment. I don't support this approach. If peritoneal dialysis fails, we can think of uh, hemodialysis, vascular access, if the, we are starting with the first initiative of PD. But uh, doing the both accesses together, I don't like it. Like it or reduce the flow in arterial fistula in patients with heart failure and the pulmonary hypertension, particularly following renal transplantation. Regarding the effects of uh, cardiovascular disease on survival, so this is the if if the uh, survival when present is just six six percent. After two years, there is forty percent mortality. So we should think of all these points. And even the, the need for procedures are associated with increased mortality. But we shouldn't discriminate CKD patients. Yes, mortality 
can increase with revascularization if we have patients on C with CKD or on dialysis. But if we leave them, mortality is very high. So do you risk stratification? If revascularization is indicated, please don't deprive CKD and dialysis patients from revascularization. One important issue for nephrologists is to avoid excessive ultrafiltration rate because it was shown that excessive ultrafiltration rate exceeding 13 milliliter per kg per hour during hemodialysis is associated with increased cardiovascular mortality. Regarding beta blocker, here uh, one of the important issue is dialysability of beta blockers. Look here, we have atinilol, metoprolol, bisoprolol, carvedilol. So here the uh, uh, the uh, here you can go to the dialysability or not. Atinilol is high dialyzer. So this is why I don't recommend at all using atinilol for hemodialysis patient. Why? Because it is extensively dialyzable. What is meant by extensively dialyzable? So it may be associated with, with arrhythmias or, or hypertension at the end of dialysis. So I don't like this drug in dialysis patients because it is highly dialyzable and may explain increased this. In comparison to atinilol, you can find other drugs here, uh, so we don't uh, encourage atinilol or metoprolol. Bisoprolol is less dialyzable in comparison to atinilol and metoprolol, but and carvedilol is either non-dialyzable or minimally dialyzable. So in dialysis patients, if we need the uh, beta blocker, the best is carvedilol, especially if there is intra dialytic hypertension, blood pressure increases uh, within the end of the dialysis or at the end of the dialysis may be due to the use of dialyzable atinolol. Uh, here, if we use carvedilol, it will solve the problem. What about digoxin? I hate digoxin for the hemodialysis patients and to be abundant. Why abundant? Because uh, the available potassium dialysate level in, in Egypt is uh, two millimole per liter. If we dialyze the patient against 2 millimole per liter, this will lead to hypokalemia during the dialysis that may precipitate digital intoxication. This is why if we uh, should use digoxin, and I think in cardiology, there is no should be used, but if the patient is linked to digoxin because it improves uh, his or her symptoms, uh, if we should use, we should use the standard of care, normal potassium, Dialysate, and it is not available in uh, in Egypt. It is not only the drugs to be uh, re restricted, but all drugs in hemodialysis. If the, if the drugs are not extremely indicated, it's better to be avoided. Why? Because you will be surprised if you know that even antibiotics can lead to increased QT syndrome, and these patients have higher prevalence of keto problems and conduction problems that may lead to arrhythmias. Regarding transplantation, before transplantation, should we do revascularization? This is a study. Revascularization versus medical management of coronary artery disease in pre-transplant patients. This is a meta-analysis. Uh, after uh, evaluating 700 articles, uh, uh, six studies including the meta-analysis uh, uh, comparing medical management uh, to coronary vascularization and th there was no difference. So the idea is we should evaluate the patient, risk stratify, and it is not mandatory to do revascularization before transplantation if the cardiologist's uh, opinion is in favor of medical treatment because the data shows no difference in mortality. This is a case of uh, the live kidney donor transplantation. Suppose this is a live kidney transplantation treated with immune suppressive protocol, including tacrolimus, one of the calcium inhibitors member. The patient presents with hypertension and hyperkalemia. If we think of correlation between tacrolimus and the hypertension and hyperkalemia, which is the best drug to be used? The answer is, is it azides, bimetanide, torsemide, Acesolamide, amlodopine, lozartan, carvedilol. Uh, here the answer is thiazides. Why thiazides? Because this is the mechanisms, the effect of tacrolimus. Tacrolimus increases 
sodium glucose, uh, sodium chloride co-transporters within the distal convertibule, leading to excessive salt reabsorption, and they reduce the sodium delivered to the collecting tubules, uh, uh, will lead to a reduction of potassium secretion and hyperkalemia, to block the action of tacrolimus on sodium chloride co-transporter in this convertible, we should use a drug that works in this site, which is cyazides. Tacrolimus may be associated with acute heart failure to be put in differential diagnosis. Bricada effusion after thorough evaluation of the patients, regain immunology, overload, infection, ETC. At the end of the day, you may find that tacrolimus is the cause of uh, pericardial effusion, so we should think of the drugs because drugs may be the reason for and the cause of the uh, manifestations. Inhibitor inhibitors like uh, serolimus or rabomycin or everolimus uh, certican and cardiovascular disease. There is a paradox because these drugs are associated with hypercholesterolemia, but uh, uh, can we use them? Uh, in the patients with increased risk of atherosclerosis, although they they lead to hypercholesterolemia, they are protective against atherosclerosis. Why? Because blocking immature leads to uh, 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 in improvement in lipophagy, LDL expression, autophagy associated cholesterol efflux, and reduction of proliferation, and increasing the cholesterol efflux within the atheroma, so all these are beneficial effects in our patient. This is, even if, if we think of using serolimus eluted stents for, since a uh, uh, period of time, this means that uh, they are beneficial anti-atherosclerotic drugs. Regarding echocardiography, and this is the last part of my talk, I'm interested in echocardiography because I started the journey with echocardiography since the early uh, period of my residency in, in 1994, when I was advised by Professor Sobh is to do echocardiography. So echocardiography may help us in, in nephrology. And I remember some cases that the biopsy, renal biopsy was uh, very difficult to be done. And after doing echocardiography because the patients have some manifestation referring to uh, amyloidosis like uh, 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 low voltage ECG. In the, uh, so we do echocardiography and we found the amyloidotic changes in the heart and the valves and the muscles. And at that time, we uh, uh, think of uh, renal amyloidosis because uh, the biopsy was contraindicated. We, uh, I remember a case of uh, rapid progressive crescentic gluconephritis who was admitted, and uh, because of tachycardia, I think of uh, echocardiogram, and I found vegetations on tricuspid valve. So here, if we both the extremes, if we think of uh, crescentic gluconephritis treatment is immunosuppressive drugs, but because it is associated with infective endocarditis, the treatment is not steroids, the treatment is antibiotics, and doing surgery to remove the uh, vegetation and the, replace the valve. So this is how the echocardiogram even uh, helps us to uh, decide the treatment. And it is now routine in preparing patients for transplantation. And this is uh, one of the publications about the effective effect of spontaneous closure of the fistula on cardiac structure and function. In this study, we proved that spontaneous closure of fistula after transplantation in a group of patients with surveillance echocardiogram uh, uh, was shown to be associated with reduction of cardiac output and the cardiac index that uh, uh, reduces the bad effects of hyperdynamic circulation. Another study in transplant patients with uh, serial uh, echocardiographic monitoring, and we found that the persistent left ventricular hypertrophy after kidney transplantation was associated with bad effects on the transplantation outcome. And here, we know nowadays we are aware by BOCAS, what's meant by BOCAS is the point of care ultrasound is to encourage nephrologists to do ultrasound for the kidneys, for the fistula, and for the heart. 
and it just bar a signal axis view putting the probe and if we find the valve is is opening mitral valve is opened well and the muscle is moving and no uh, or uh, black color here this means no bricada effusion so it's just one half half a minute and to know the performance of the heart and if we know that if we want the details we can refer to echocardiographer and this is why i uh, i incorporated this uh, uh, within the training of african uh, uh, of the doctors who came to us from africa during within the activities of the 11th international hemodialysis course so it is very interesting to be aware by echocardiogram uh, do we know everything? The answer is no, because there are a lot of unknowns, and the, the smartness of uh, a doctor is to try to solve unknowns by increasing uh, education, and this is the platform of nephrology education that was founded in 2012. Uh, here we are reaching more than 300, uh, 3,400 lectures. 1,400 videos and even a uh, bachelor degree in nephrology. Uh, so a lot of uh, activities in education um, because I'm believing that I'm living because I'm learning. And the most important issue is to uh, encourage research and to uh, build relationship with patients, to know patients. Because William Usler stated, he who studies medicine without books, sails an uncharted sea, but he who studies medicine without patients doesn't go to see at all. So we need education, training, and gaining experience with the patients, and uh, the, to do research, to fill the gaps. And uh, last Thursday, we have the regular meeting of the Kahalin Project Group, and within this uh, gathering, prestigious gathering, uh, uh, we celebrate uh, the tribute of Professor Sobh because uh, he has this prestigious award, the Nile Award, and for the highest degree, the highest award in the, for the academic achievements, and that's one of the the uh, reasons and the uh, for this award to Professor Sob is the his uh, activities in research, and the Professor Sob is unique in academic and research physicians, so he's a role model. And all of us are very proud of Professor Sob. At the end of the presentation, I, I, I uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy if you have any question. Thank you and goodbye.